رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي ربنا زدنا علما ربنا زدنا علما ربنا زدنا علما ان شاء الله تعالى we will going to the idea is to most probably wrap up surah an-nas tafsir tonight there isn't much to talk about in detail. We talked about a lot of those things when we were here last time. And majority of those concepts are the ones that are shared with the surahs before. Especially Surah Al-Falaq and some of it from Surah Al-Fatiha. I think you should do half, no, half. Half, half, no, half, half next time. People, they don't know because the people are expecting to start next week. So. I will going to send them the recordings. Okay. Yes, because it's it's getting yeah, recorded. And all and and all that I'll going to inshallah send, send them too. Next week. So, uh, one of the points that we talked about last time was there are three qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are talked about right at the beginning of this surah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Rabb, He is the Malik, and He is the Ilah. These three properties we learn about in Surah An-Nas. Now, some ulama in their tafsir and like these, some are like a lot of them, are basically the one that I went through, gave the example of a human being. And say when the human being is born, human being needs to be nurtured and need to be provided with and need to be given things by which this person can grow <laughs> spiritually, could grow physically, could need to be given an environment. And in that environment, that little baby, that little child is very much dependent on the family alone. Nobody from outside of the family. That is the quality of the Rabb. That is given to this little child when he is at the stage of growing. When the person has grown to a certain age, he realizes that my requirements can partially be fulfilled by my family, but then there are other requirements that need to be fulfilled by the society. So he goes out to the society, for example, in terms of education, you need to be provided with schooling. So somebody else will going to be teaching you after your preliminary education. After that, your college and all of the way through, when you get employed, there's going to be a boss. So wherever you go, there will going to be some form of rulership that you will be under, some form of administration that you will going to be under. And that administration will going to be like a pyramid that every stage will going to be reporting to a state above. So the school principal is reporting to the superintendent and the superintendent is reporting to somebody at the state level. The state level is getting funding from the federal government. Or, so it it's basically goes all the way up. So that is a quality that we realize is in the word malik. That some ownership is there and we go under that ownership and we benefit from that ownership. So there is a partial contribution from the family and then there is a partial contribution from there. Then there comes a time when the person says that these means of sustenance, in-house or outside, are not enough for me to sustain in this world in peace. So to gain other sets of knowledge which cannot be provided by these means, he goes to somebody supreme higher up. And that's where the worship aspect comes. And this is the aspect of ilah. So these three aspects is what a person deals with right from the birth all the way till the person dies. He has certain requirements which are fulfilled by family. He has certain requirements which are fulfilled by society. And then certainly he has a lot of requirements which are fulfilled by the deity that he worships, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who also provides him with the family and the society to fulfill the other things. But these are the three aspects that are being talked about in the first three ayahs that those are the stages at which the human development goes through. Then comes the aspect that, okay, now I am worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now I need protective forces to keep worshipping Him. That's where the remaining of the surah talks about, that min sharril waswas, that from the shar of the one who whispers in your chest, and he is al-khannas, means he attacks, goes back. Attacks goes back. Now that going back and attacking happens in two different ways. Number one, he attacks. If he is successful, he still goes back. If he's unsuccessful, he still goes back to attack with a greater force. So either way he is going and coming back. Going and coming back. So it's a constant process from the birth all the way till you die. 
that you are getting influenced by some internal forces which are whispering you to do certain acts. And the decision is yours to make whether to do the right thing or to do the wrong thing. And that's what basically you are going to be judged with. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that one of the reasons of your creation, the main core reason of your creation is لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا That when you come back to us, we are going to see who among you did the best job. So that is an aspect. الَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُ فِي صُدُورِ النَّاسِ And مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ Could be from the jinns and could be from the humans. So we talked about these things. Now I would like to go in a little bit more detail in hadith, one by one, which I briefly talked about or might have talked about a little bit more detail. But this, this one particular tafsir sums him up with references of the book. So that's why I want to bring this forth here. So the first one that I would like to present to you over here is <clears throat> the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said مَا مِنْكُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا وَقَدْ وُكِّلَ بِهِ قَرِيلُهُ There is nobody among you who is without somebody who constantly whispers into him. Then the Prophet was asked by the companion that even with you there is a shaitan element that whispers. He said نَعْم إِلَّا أَنَّ اللَّهَ أَعَانَنِي عَلَيْهِ فَأَسْلَمَ فَلَا يَأْمُرُنِي إِلَّا بِخَيْرِ Yes, even with me. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was so merciful unto me that this particular shaitan accepted the faith and all he now advises me is good. He does not advise me on anything bad. This particular hadith has been reported by Imam Muslim and he brings this hadith under a title of Sifatul Munafiqeen wa Ahkabahum under a book in which the title of the book is The Qualities of the Hypocrites and What Are the Rulings Against Them. So basically when this shaitan whispers into our heart, there comes a point when we become hypocrite. Why? Because there is an internal human being and then there is an external human being. And we are living in two worlds. We have two faces. The inside face is evil. We don't want to show that face to anybody. But the outside face is what we are concerned about. So this is where the person, if continuously dwells in that mindset, is doing hypocrisy. Now, hypocrisy is of two different states. There's a hypocrisy in actions, and there's a hypocrisy in belief. The people of the Medina were hypocrites in belief, or the munafiqeen of al-aqidah. They had the wrong hypocrisy, because their hypocrisy was that, I believe, they'll tell you on your faces, but they did not really believe. Hypocrisy of deeds is something else. It means... I'll do actions to show off. Rather, I don't really mean that by any of those actions. If you're not looking at me, I won't do it. If you look at me, I'll do it. So that's a totally different hypocrisy. But either way, it is one of the qualities of hypocrisy which shaitan instills in the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May they be from the humans or may they be from the jinns. Another hadith which I quoted to you, but now I want to give you the reference. And this hadith has been quoted by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. Here in the hadith that I am bringing you, it is in a lot more detail than the hadith that I presented to you earlier on. And then there is another version of this hadith which is even longer. So, but here I am going to try to sum up both hadith. And they, this one comes from both Bukhari and Muslim. The other one is only in Bukhari. Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu reports, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the month of Ramadan, the last 10 days, he would do the i'tikaf, sit in the masjid, right? For the 10 days. And in one of those nights, one of his wives, Safiya radiallahu ta'ala anha, came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After they had this conversation going, whatever they wanted to talk, husband and wife, the Prophet said, okay, Safiya, are you about to leave? He, she said, yeah. So he said, okay, I will going to walk with you. Now, this is a beautiful aspect. So, walking with your wife is not something below par. <laughs> okay, That is need to be understood. She is your pride, so it's okay to be walking with the pride. So, he walked with her. Now, the hadith says that all these wives had their doors opening up in Masjid al-Nabwi. So, when they got by the door of Another wife, and her name was Umm Salama. Umm Salama or Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha. That is the place where the two companions went past them. At that door. Okay? Right at that door. 
And these companions, when we were passing Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and it's a night time, they looked at the Prophet and said, "Assalamu alaikum," and they noticed that he has a woman with her, with him. So they quickly, rushly started walking away from the Prophet. So that was the point when the Prophet said, "Ala risli kuma," stop, wait, and then they turned to the Prophet, and he said to them. إنها صفية بنت أحي. With me is a woman, and her name is Safiya, who is the daughter of Uhay. Now this is where I would like to stop again and explain one more point. Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم right away stopped them. على رسلكما stop. And as a matter of obedience, they stopped right away and turned to the Prophet. That means when somebody is having a conversation, you need to have eye contact with that individual, or some form of. Now, the reason this has become more important nowadays than any of the other time because of the social media, people are so busy in their little gadgets that when you're having conversation with them, they don't have eye contact. They don't have eye contact with you. And they're constantly busy in their phone, which is so uncivil. And these are educated people. And I'm not talking about illiterate. These are college graduates, young people. You are talking to them, and they're looking at their phone, and yet conversing with you. They're out there with you on the dinner table. They're out with you in the dining in the in, in one of the hotels or anywhere you go restaurants. It doesn't matter where you are in a big setup. Yet, why are you even there when you don't even want to be there? Okay, that is its point. That you need to have a conversation going on there. So when they turn, and now notice what Prophet said. He said, "This is Innaha." Didn't say this is my wife, because it could be any one of the many, right? Said Innaha Safiya. He didn't even stop there. This is Safiya. That probably was more than enough to be understood, right? Literally said Safiya bin the Uhay, because there could be more than one Safiya in the Medina. So this is the Safiya who is the daughter of Uhay. Now Uhay is a very prominent person, was a very prominent person in Medina, because he was one of the chiefs. He was Jewish, and he was a chief of one of the Jewish tribes. When they were ex- they were asked to leave, they left for Khaybar. When Khaybar was conquered, Prophet married Safiya. Safiya was brought over here. So this family was known to people of Medina. This Uhay bin Akhtab is the ruler or the leader of this whole Banu Nazir tribe. And she's the daughter of this chief. And she was married a few times before, before she came in the house of the Prophet. So he explained who am I with. So the companions, they said, SubhanAllah, Ya Rasulullah, you do not have to explain this to us. The reason was that in another hadith it says in the in the little paragraph it says in little uh, parentheses that companions did not liked that the prophet thought that they would have any ill thought about prophet they did not like that fact so they responded right away subhanallah what are you talking about we would never even think about that and then the prophet said إن الشيطان يجري من ابن آدم مجري الدم. The shaitan goes through your body, rushes through your body like the blood. Okay. وَإِنِّي خَشِيتُ and I was extremely worried أن يخذف في قلوبكما شيئا that he would instill something in your hearts. I was worried because if he would do that successfully. It doesn't matter how pious you are, your akhirah is gone. Because you had ill feelings against me, who you believed in. So the shaitan is going through the human body. What does that mean? It has several different meanings. One meaning could be, he could inspire you to an extent that you would use any part of your body to commit a sin. Second of all, He is so close to your body, yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, where am I? I'm even closer to your juggler, Wayne. My closeness is far more closer than anybody who surrounds you. So it doesn't matter how powerful this thing is, I am the most supreme. So through me come in the protection. 
Come in my protection. I will protect you. That's basically the core purpose of these two surahs. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ I want external protection. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ I want internal protection. So this hadith was reported in Sahih al-Bukhari, in Kitab al-I'tikaf, in Sahih al-Muslim, in, uh, in a book of As-Salam, and several other books. Okay, now... Um, Let's go to the second, uh, next one. This hadith is reported by Sa'id bin Jubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he says that Ibn Abbas says, now Ibn Abbas, this is the call of Ibn Abbas. And he says, Al-Waswas il-Khannas. That means this particular word, Al-Waswas il-Khannas, mean that whispers and it goes back and comes back, is the fact that shaitan is constantly looking at the state of your heart. Okay? He's constantly looking at the state of your heart. He's waiting for you to not remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment you get into that state that you lose Allah's consciousness. That's what's called the remembrance. The moment you lose that consciousness is the point where he attacks you. Similarly, Mujahid and Qatada, these are the students of Tafsir of Ibn Abbas. They also had the similar things reported in their, in their writings. Mu'tamir bin Sulaiman reports from his dad, Sulaiman, and he said, I have been told that shaitan, when he's attached to the human heart and he's constantly looking into it, Generally speaking, human heart goes through two sets of emotions. If you look at the larger umbrella. One is sadness and one is happiness. Now that sadness could eventually trigger anger, animosity, ill feelings. But it is the sad heart. That's why the terminology that's used in English is that this person has a sick heart, sad heart means it being struck with ill. On the contrary, there is a joyful heart, a happy heart. It's a happy heart or if it's a sad heart. In both situations, that heart should be submissive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he's sad, he should turn to his Lord. When he's happy, he should be turning to his Lord in thankingness and in asking for help. So he is constantly attached to that human heart, looking at the state of the human heart. The moment that heart, it doesn't matter what state it is in, is in the God's conscious, then he withdraws himself. The moment it goes away from the God's conscious is when he attacks. This particular explanation has been provided, has been list given to us in the Tafsir at Tabri. So he basically brought this uh, explanation from the sheikh that I listed to you. Mu'tamir bin Sulaiman, he reports it from that. Awfi, who is one of the person who asked Ibn Abbas, he says, Al-Waswas means that shaitan basically tells a human to do something. He tells a human to do something. When he does it, he backs off. That's basically another meaning that he brings about here. Um, Imam Ahmad reports it from Ab- Ibn Abbas عنهم, that a man came in the presence of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and this hadith is also reported by Sunan Abi Dawud and many other uh, sorry this hadith is reported in Tafsir Ibn Kathir sorry that a man came in the presence of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and said that in my heart I have ill feelings That if I utter them, if I utter them, if I speak about them, the heavens shall fall on my head and I'll be destroyed. And the Prophet, when he listened to this and said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillahi alladhi radda kaydahu ila alwaswasa. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. All praises is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who basically is capable of turning the plan of shaitan against him. He's the one who can turn the shaitan's plan against him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done it several times. Even in the Quran we know about it. Even in the books of Sirah we know about it. That they plan something 
and Allah overturned their plan. Sometimes their plan apparently looks successful, yet it backfired them. For example, they tried to kill the Prophet, but Allah saved him. They even got to the entrance of the cave, Allah still saved him. They even got so close to the Prophet that they could see the Prophet, the Suraqa ibn Malik is riding on his horse, getting, trying to get closer, yet he is falling back. So constantly they're after him. Constantly they're after him. They come in Uhud. The people of Medina have suffered heavy losses. Yet Abu Sufyan, even though he thinks he, he was victorious in Uhud, he turns back and he camps in a place called Al Hamra ul Asad. And when Prophet knows that he is on this side of the Medina, in close to Hamra ul Asad, he asks his companions to let's camp in Ahmra al-Asad. When Abu Sufyan comes to know about it, he sends a man by the name of Naim ibn Mas'ud and says, Okay, Naim, I'm going to give you 20 camels. Because Naim ibn Mas'ud was a businessman who would always go from south to north, north to south. He was from up north by Iraq region. But he would always go past Medina. He had a lot of friends in Medina. And he was a kind of a guy, whenever he would come in Medina, he would throw parties. So everybody loved the guy who throws parties, right? So he gives you free food. So he said, okay, I'm going to do this job. If you give me 20 camels, he comes in the camps of the Muslims in Hamra ul Asad and he tells them, Abu Sufyan has a big, huge army. And he's getting more army coming towards this direction. It is better for you to leave the site and go back to Medina and accept your defeat. So he tried his level best. But the people... But the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, Hasbullah wa na'mal wakil. Allah is with us. Allah will going to protect us. So this particular propaganda, despite the fact Abu Sufyan tried his level best, was not successful, and he was the one who had to leave and run away. He was the one who had to leave and run away. So when the people from Khaybar wanted everybody to gather and attack Medina, the Battle of Ditch, the Khandaq, happened. So one of the points he raised to Abu Sufyan when he went and met him in the Makkah was uh, is with Uhay ibn Akhtab and Salam ibn Mushkam and several other people. And he said, Abu Sufyan, what happened a couple of years ago? He said, we went in the Uhud, we defeated them. He said, then, what did you do? He said, we came back. He said, think about it. You had a victorious day in Uhud. You should have attacked Medina. <laughs> you should have attacked Medina and destroyed them completely. So the problem was, who took that thought away from Abu Sufyan? Because they came to wipe off people of Medina. Yet, they were so glorified with the little victory that they got in the battlefield that this thought never occurred to them that we should go and finish them off. When the people of Medina, the hypocrites of Medina, you know, not the actual, the hypocrites of Medina and the other tribes of Medina could have helped them. Yet, that thought never occurred to them. And when the Prophet said to him in the Uhud, that yes, don't be too full of yourself today, Abu Sufyan, let's meet next year in the Badr, the same place we defeated you last year, let's meet again. He never showed up. He never showed up. So who was planning all these things? Shaitan is making sure that these people of Makkah are constantly fighting their own people. And then on top of that, getting into fight with those people who were never their enemies to start with. But that Allah is overturning the plan over to them over and over again. Then comes a point when the Prophet is camped outside of the Makkah and now he wants to go and perform the Umrah. They have nothing on them to fight. They're all in Ahram. Yet they were stopped by the people of Makkah. Despite the fact Prophet took a very long route, Hudaybiyah is not in the route of Medina. In order for you to come to the Hudaybiyah, you would have to go like this and enter the Makkah. It's a totally different route. Yet, somehow... By the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how did the Muslims stop? They could have easily entered the haram. No problem. The camel of the Prophet Muhammad sat down. 
The camel of the Prophet sat down and they could see that if we just enter this region, we will be in We will be in a region which is sacred. Nobody will be touching us. But the camel refused to walk. So when the Sahaba tried and the camel would not move, the Prophet said, that is by the will of Allah. He doesn't want us to go any further. And then the whole pact of Hudaybiyah took place. When the pact of Hudaybiyah took place, apparently all the clauses were against the people of Medina. That if somebody accepts Islam in Makkah and comes to Medina, you have to return him back. If anybody in the Medina wants to leave your religion, he should, and he comes to Makkah, we're not going to give him back. Those kind of harsh things. So apparently the Prophet is signing all of them out. And Omar did not like it. And Omar asked Abu Bakr, why are we signing such an agreement? We are not less anymore. Like 1400 of us are right here. We could easily take care of these guys. And Abu Bakr said, Omar, he's the Prophet of God. He doesn't do things out of his own will. He does things because Allah is asking him to do so. And over the period of time, things proved otherwise. For example, think about it like this logically. A person who wants to leave Islam and you force him to stay in Medina, he would constantly still instill the same thought process in the minds of others and will cause fitna. It is better for him to leave. Logically, it makes sense. This person should not stay. On the other hand, if somebody accepts Islam in Makkah and comes to Medina, if you send him back to Makkah, now he is doing the work of Allah. He will going to not sit quiet there. He will try to approach other people and will try to see if he can make some more followers. So either way, it was a win-win situation, but if you think otherwise. Okay, now what happens? They send some of these men out to Medina. And then they asked them to be sent back. And these people, instead of going to Medina, at, because they knew it will, they will be sent back, they stayed in the region between Makkah and Medina. And they started destroying Makkans economically. It was, they started an economic war against the people of Makkah. That if we go to Medina, the Prophet will return it because it's a treaty. If we stay in Makkah, they prosecute us. So we're going to stay in a land which is in the middle of nowhere or not owned by anybody, yet we will go in to destroy them economically because they're our enemies. So that economic war cost them so much money that they themselves came to the Medina and asked the Prophet, take these people. <laughs> take them. We don't want them anywhere but in Medina. So they basically, over the period of time, came and canceled majority of the items that they initially thought were in their favor. So Allah is a planner. Allah planned things a certain way. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that initially, you may find things to be not working in your direction, in your favor, but you do not understand the good that it holds. Yusuf alayhi salam suffered greatly, but that suffering... Leverage entire Bani Israel. All the children of Israel became royal family. This one person suffered though. And that suffering was for the entire many years. It was not a one or two year suffering. Entire teenagehood and youthhood and later on it was all suffering. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a place where he basically progressed. But that progression helped an entire generation and their children and children. So sometimes this happens. There is some suffering, there is some test, but the outcomes are awesome. So this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that sometimes these things are overturned against him and it makes him run away from you. So when we have waswasa or this internal feeling, ulama have used a terminology for this. They say this is called hadithun nafs. Hadith basically in Arabic language means communication or talking. Nafs means your inside. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, give, has given, it's a blessing from Him, our inside to also communicate back. Otherwise, think about it, if there was no communication from inside, there was going to be a lot of suffocation. The expression of ideas, if it was left totally on the brain, it would have been a totally different world. Because think about it like this. 
There are certain laws in the U.S. which are legal if you follow them, but they could be unethical. For example, if somebody doesn't pay me rent, and after a certain time frame, I decide to overthrow that person on the street, so legally I could do that. Is it ethical to throw somebody out on the street in the middle of the night? Just because they were like, okay, it's 12 a.m., it was due yesterday, you didn't pay me, and you get out. Or what about those electric companies? How, how about if they cut off the heating and cooling and water of all those houses which are not paying their dues? There are certain things that can be done, but if everything was left to logic and rationality, this world would be a disaster. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instill a big portion of this world on mercy. Because mercy is not compelled by rationality all the time. It is rather something that overcomes rationality and says, no, it's okay to let go. It's okay to let go. So that mercy aspect is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that shaitan will constantly ask you not to be merciful. But on the other hand, I am the one who is merciful and I want you to be merciful. So this hadith of nafs is a process by which things establish in us. And Shah Muhaddis Dehlui is a big guy who lived in the 1700s, did a lot of work in the, in the India and Pakistan area. And he writes in, in one of his works is that it's a, it's a stages or the steps of the process. Once you hear something, it becomes your foundation. For example, when you accept Islam, you have accepted it because you've heard about it, you were convinced about it. So that becomes your aqidah, your belief. But belief is not yet strong. Did you just say Shah Waliullah Yes. So Shah Waliullah Muhaddis Dehli, so he basically said that when you establish that, it, will, it basically makes your belief, your aqidah. But your aqidah may not be strong enough until you bombard it with more information. This, uh, this woman, he was the first person to translate Quran. Quran, right. So, yes. So when, he, when, when you bombard it with good thoughts or a long period of time, and you sit in the companionship of good people, it takes a point of what we call irada. It gets stronger. Then, that irada can take you to action. So shaitan, he knows these stages and he tries to get you at each of these stages. So for each of the stages, there is a different way that you can protect yourself. If he's attacking your belief system, you have to do a different remedy than if he was attacking you at an action level. If he's attacking you at an intentional level, where you're making your intentions, it's a different mechanism that you have to follow to tackle him. So this is something a human being has to learn. This is called the training of nafs. You have to train your nafs to fight the actions of shaitan, and that's basically what he talks about in that particular aspect. <clears throat> now, some of the other things about shaitan, that how he influences individuals, in another tafsir, it's uh, actually a hadith reported by Sayyidina Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala, when he said, the Prophet said, whenever the call for adhan is given, whenever the call for adhan is given, shaitan turns and runs away. Till the call of the Adhan comes to an end. When the call to an Adhan comes to an end, he returns back. He returns back. Why? Because he has a job to do. Stop him from praying. He has a job to do. So now, he's trying his level best between the Adhan and the Iqama. When the Iqama takes place, he again runs away. But when the Akama is completed, he returns back. Now, why does he return back now? Because now he says, okay, I could not stop this person from praying. However, I can try to make sure that his prayer is incomplete. Okay? I can instill in his mind things that he was not thinking about. New ideas. 
You probably may have heard, I personally heard it, you personally witnessed it, somewhere in the middle of the Salah, you get certain things solved that you were not able to solve outside of the Salah. All these answers just come to you. It's like, whoa, what a fool. It was a very complicated problem and you just solved it and, and now you're busy in that. Okay? You may be in the state where you're saying, oh Allah, thank you very much. You know, I was not able to... Oh, but this is the Salah. You're not supposed to be doing all of that stuff. So he sometimes uses faith against you. It sometimes uses faith against you. For example, today, I witnessed this in the Jummah. There were three kids, they were, I think, brothers, right in the front row. I mean, like, right, right in my front row. And they were all constantly talking during the Salah and pushing, and they were like nine, seven, four-year-olds. So the guy who was standing behind them, I, did, I think he didn't know about it. He said, Salah is going on, right? And then he did it several times in the Salah. And the guy who was right next to him, who was actually right next to me, because he was just in a way, a guy away from me, he said, when he was going for a sajda, he noticed one of them was coming back, he said, No! <laughs> No, no, no. The going on. <laughs> they don't know any better. You know, they don't know any better. I, I even heard that during the Fusbah, you know, people take it like Fusbah before the Salah. People say, if this is with me and Fusbah is talking, and, and Ramadan goes, hey man, you guys shut up, or you guys quiet. Even you're not supposed to say that. Yeah, yeah. Even in the khutbah, nobody is supposed I, to. I've done it before. Isn't it? People who didn't say anything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, the same thing happens, you know, these kids would probably stop for a second and they'll... Same thing happens with adults, you know. Yeah. If you turn back and look, give them a look, even that's not allowed. Turning back and giving them a look is not allowed. So if, even if you give them a look, they will look at you and then after two, two seconds they'll start again. That, because that means you're not connected. They're either, you are stopping somebody, you're not connected. Or, or the other thing is this, that the presence of the khutbah is like the replacement of the two raka'ah. Yeah, exactly. that you do. So would you have this kind of conversation in the middle of the salah? No. Nope. So when you're not going to have that kind of conversation in the middle of Salah, you can't have it in the khutbah either. But the problem is somebody needs to educate them too. You know, you mentioned a great name, uh, I, I don't know the talk about, but uh, I think he's the one who said, Joe Dum, uh, you understand Urdu, right? Yeah. He, uh, I think he understands too. Joe Dum Ghafil, So Dum Ghafil. Yeah, the, the moment you lose the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the moment that you know you spend the companionship of the shaitan is basically. So anyway, so these are the kind of things that he tries to instill. And this hadith is, uh, and then the hadith continues that he basically tries to make you remember things that you have not remembered before. And in that state, he makes sure that when you are praying behind, you forget the count of the salah. You're not there physically, you're not there mentally. And then when the Imam says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, then he wakes you up and says, Oh, good, Allah is done. Because his job is done. <laughs> okay? So this is reported by Imam Bukhari in Kitabul Adhan, Babu Fadlit Ta'deed. Similarly, the hadith that I reported to you earlier about uh, Safiya and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, I want to give you the reference. The detail one is only in Bukhari and also in Muslim. And this hadith is reported by Ali bin Hussein. Ali bin Hussein. Who is Ali bin Hussein? Ali is the one who is commonly known by Zayn al Abidin. He is the grandson of Ali radiallahu ta'ala through Hussein. He's the only one who survived the battle of Karbala. So, majority of the hadith that Hussein radiallahu ta'ala who told his sons, he's the only survivor, so he's the only narrator of all those hadiths. Because the oldest son died, the younger one was a newborn, so he was the only son left. So, anytime we get to see this name of Ali bin Hussein, that Ali is Zayn al Abidin. And Imam Bukhari. And several other majority of books of ulama have taken hadith from these people because they are big people. So anyway, so Sayyidina Ali bin Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who is the son of Hussein, and Hussein named his son after his dad. 
So that is another thing I want to talk about. Then Sayyidina Jabir bin Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala as they say, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that Iblis has a throne, you mean like a king, his little throne. And then he calls, he has a court in which he summons the main people that are under him. And then when he calls upon his court, in that court there are people who are closer to him and then there are people that are far from him. So every time somebody comes and reports, he says, what do you do today? He says, I caused a great fitna in this world. Then he tells him, what's the big deal? Anybody can do that. Anybody can cause fitna. Go away, you didn't do anything good. So another man comes, and another shaitan comes and says, what I did today is a fitna, but I caused this fitna between the husband and the wife to an extent that they left each other. And then he says, come on here. This is the job I'm talking about. He hugs that person. He brings him closer to him and make him sit right next to him. This is basically his thought process. Causing a little bit of a fitna is not a big deal to him. He wants the big deal. The idea is the big deal is he wants to cause fitna in those relationships that there is no other relationship to replace it. That's where he wants to strike. That's where he wants to cause the fitna. So this hadith is reported by Imam Muslim in Kitab. Again, Sifatul Munafiqeen, the characteristics of hypocrites. This is the name of the book. Because whenever you see these books, Imam Muslim wrote a book, a complete big book. In that book, he has sub-books. So when we say Kitab Sifat al Munafiqeen by Kitab al Book, it's a sub book inside that main book, which is by the name of Sifat al Munafiqeen. And inside that book, now he makes chapters. So the chapter under which he reports this hadith, the chapter in Arabic is called Bab. Bab. This is the Bab, or this is the, the heading under which he brings Tahrish al Shaytan. So this is how you notice that these books are. The different ulama have taken different approaches. Even, they, even though they call their book, this, this is the book of hadith, under which they may say this is the book of tawheed. Now all the hadith over here will be about the tawheed. But within that book, they were going to subclassify by bab. And each bab, everybody will take a totally different approach. Sometimes they'll start a bab with the ayah from the Holy Quran and then list the hadith. Sometimes they list the hadith and then list the other hadith. So everybody takes a little different approach, but that's something literary for knowledge purpose. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrates, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, that everyone among you had somebody from the shaitan who is with that person. Then people said, Ya Rasulullah even with you? He said, yeah, he's with, even with me. But now this one only tells me the good. So this hadith I presented to you earlier, this is also reported by Imam Muslim, again in the same chapter, Sifat al Munafiqeen. Okay, now this is a beautiful hadith that I found in Imam Bukhari, Kitab al Ith. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah for my sake. Okay, whenever these words come in, Allah for my sake, this means this is something that was not given to the people before us. This is a special arrangement made for this ummah alone for the sake of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why he uses the word, indeed, Allah for my sake, for my ummah, Allah has uplifted the sin that if an ill thought comes in their hearts, it is not recorded. It means the people before us, they were even giving the recordings of the ill thoughts. And then, when is it recorded? When the person acts upon it or spreads it? As long as it's contained within you, it's not recorded. Nobody gets to know about it. Angels don't write it. There's no record of it. Imam Bukhari reports it in Kitab al it basically means to be freed. Okay? So, this is a chapter. Babul Khata wa Nisyan fil Ataqah. 
And Imam Muslim brings it in a different book. Imam Muslim brings it in Kitabul Iman. Now, why these books matter? These books matter because that tells you the thought process of those people who collected the hadith. That Imam Muslim found this hadith to be the core of the Iman. That this should be told to a believer. That your Lord is so merciful. So he reports it in Kitab al-Iman. That is the importance of these babs that tells you the thought process of the person who reports it. Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala who says that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, Shaitan may come to one of you. Now that could be inside or could be through another soul. Could come to you and ask you, who created this? Who created that? And then you are going to get involved in trying to answer these questions. When you have answered these questions and you come to the conclusion and you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it all, then he asks you, okay, then who created Allah? And that is the point where, which triggers and throws so many people off track. Because they cannot imagine something coming out of creation from nowhere. So that rationality kills them. So this is where the Prophet said when he gets to that point and brings that question in your head this is the point where you should right away come in the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's trying to play with you. He's trying to play with you. And this is reported by Imam Bukhari in a book called Bad'ul Khalq means the creation, the start of the creation. And in which he makes a chapter he called Sifatu Iblis wa Junuduhu, characteristic of the Iblis and his army. Okay, this is one of these traits or characteristics. Imam Muslim reports it in Kitabul Iman because you have to protect your Iman. So that's why he reports it in Kitabul Iman. And then he makes a chapter in which he says the chapter name is Bayanul Waswasatu fil Iman. That means stating. The waswasa, the whispering, that could affect your iman. So that is why this tells you their thought process. The same hadith may be reported under other chapters as well. So that is why what happens is some of these, like Imam Muslim or Imam Bukhari, brings one hadith several times in their books. Why? Because to them this hadith applies here as well as it applies here. As well as so they report it multiple times. That is why if you look at the total number of hadith in, in, in the Bukhari, the numbers are... Yeah, this is the last thing I want to talk about here. The ayah from the Qur'an, Surah Al-An'am. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍ عَدُوًّا شَيَاطِينِ الْإِنسِ وَالْجِنِ That for every prophet, there are enemies from both shaitan, the jinns, and also from the humans. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍ عَدُوًّا شَيَاطِينِ الْإِنسِ وَالْجِنِّ يُوحِي بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَىٰ بَعْضٍ They communicate with each other. They try to tell each other what to do, what not to do. They try to help out each other. زُخْرُفَ الْقَوْلِ غُرُورًا Their thought process and their talking and their communication might impress you. But it's all falsehood. It's all like a mirage. It's like it's like a puff. Your Lord is letting them do this. They could not have done it out of their own will or all their own power. He is letting them do it. And why would he let them do it? So that at one point of time these things strengthen the faith of the believers and also put some through the test. And at the same time, these kind of things sometimes convinces these bad people to come on the good side. There are people who are bad, but then they say, oh, let's read about these people. And then they accept his love. They come towards the right side. So it is a test. He lets them do these kind of things. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَذَرْهُمْ وَمَا يَفْتَرُونَ Leave them. Leave them and leave their lies. Don't worry about it. At the end of the day, it's a lie. Because remember, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانِ This is in Surah Al-Qaf. 
wala qad khalaqna al-insan i am the one indeed who has created the being they have not created you i have created you wa na'lamu ma tuwaswisu fi bihi nafsu and i am the one who knows what can go through your inside your nafs how far you can think what you can do what you can i am aware of that wa nahnu aqrabu ilayhi min habl al-warid and i am the one who is closer to you than your juggler way i am one i created you i know what goes in you and that's what all so that's why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that trust in me and me alone and then in another hadith reported by imam muslim prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says the summary of the hadith is that every being has two beings attached to him one is from the jinn and one is from the angels they both are your advisors so whenever you have to do an action they advise you on the action you have it is your choice you want to listen to the jinn or you want to listen to the angel and this angel is trying to make sure that your nafs does not do bad things however the nafs is what you control so if you keep listening to bad the badness gets stronger so the goodness doesn't affect you that much so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when created a being gave that being a balance giving him an evil at a good source now it is up to the being to which side the being swings so that is why when you keep doing good automatically your heart starts repelling bad even though the bad thoughts are still coming you're still getting convinced but now your heart is at a state where your heart feels this is bad and doesn't find peace in it but when your heart or your nafs goes the other way it finds peace in evil and doesn't find peace in goodness so you have a little litmus test right within you you have a little test right within you that tells you the state of your heart and the state of your mind and the state of your nafs where are you finding pleasure where are you finding peace and when we feel that this heart is hardened then that is a process to be worrisome about because if you let it go it will going to get hardened and hardened and hardened that is why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be to be the people that are really truly the one that will going to go in the jannah اقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروه انه هو الغفور الرحيم